Martin, I'm really pleased to have you on my channel. Uh, congratulations on your ELT Experiences YouTube channel. Um, it's got great content and has definitely made me more aware of the pros and cons of working online and also the strategies um, that we use to earn a sustainable income. So um, I'm looking forward to, to hearing more about your, your blended approach to, to teaching. Sure. Well, um, thank you ever so much for inviting me. It's great to have a chat with you and um, yeah, be interesting to, to see. And um, yeah, thank you for, for um, uh, following my content on my YouTube channel. It's obviously um, hit some interest and uh, yeah, um, I guess that's that's my passion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's a pleasure. Uh, so could you introduce yourself to the viewers so that they can get a better idea of you and uh, what you do for a living? Sure. Yeah, well, um, my name is Martin Sketchley, and um, if you don't know who I am, um, I've been an English language teacher for about 16 and a half years now, and um, I've been teaching in um, South Korea, Romania, and predominantly in the UK to international students. Um, I started off my YouTube channel many, many years ago when I was um, doing my MA and I thought I would share a, uh, a lesson that was recorded um, so uh, for my uh, practical element of my MA course um, in English language teaching and it kind of hit a, a, some peak and some interest and uh, and uh, yeah I carried on from there um, adding a bit of content here or there um, and with regards to my teaching, I've been teaching mainly face to face for those 16 and a half years. Um, and about five years before the pandemic kind of hit, uh, I ended up teaching online. Um, uh, so I, I had a full time English teaching job with a local language school. And uh, just to uh, supplement my income, I thought I would do some uh, online English lessons to Chinese learners and uh, this is where I started off and I worked for two or three Chinese English providers um, uh, teaching mainly kids and uh, teenagers and a few business uh, people um, and then things evolved into uh, well it seemed to get quite saturated there was a, a lot of teachers from around the world not just the UK um, uh, connecting up and teaching Chinese students um, and obviously their policy changed in China so online lessons and uh, private language lessons in mainland China took a hit particularly for kids and um, um, so then I moved on to Preply where I tend to combine my income now uh, post pandemic uh, teaching international students um, mainly in Europe a few Chinese learners uh, uh, some Koreans and uh, some South Americans as well and uh, I combine my online teaching with face to face teaching. Mm -hmm. So why did you decide to get into English teaching what was the the main Gosh. reason for that. <laughs> well, going back, um, you know, uh, almost 20 years ago, it was 2005 around Christmas time. Um, I moved to Korea with my young son and my wife, um, uh, who was Korean. And I thought uh, post um, undergraduate degree, I studied international business. I really enjoyed um, a module that I did in my final year, which was uh, cross-cultural communication or intercultural communication. And I found that really, really interesting. And I thought, well, I want to learn a bit more about my wife's background, where she's from, South Korea, and uh, learn a bit more about the culture. And uh, I naively decided to go to South Korea with my wife and young son. And um, I ended up teaching for a private language institute. At that time, I had no qualifications apart from my undergraduate degree and it kind of gave me an insight into a new culture, a new language and I thought actually I enjoy English teaching. Uh, I'm gonna make a, a go at this and do my CELTA course um, and so I ended up a, about 14 months later um, doing a CELTA 
at the British Council in Seoul and uh, it was the intensive four week program. Um, nowadays, you've got a combination of part time, full time online or blended or, you know, uh, up to I think nine or 12 weeks or something like that. But this was the, the full time four week intensive and it, it gave me a, a real um, interest and insight into what could be possible and um, in terms of this profession. Um, and that, that's how I ended up getting into it, I suppose. How was the experience in, in South Korea? Um, it was really interesting. The first 12 months, though, were quite tough. Um, this was at a time when things weren't so you had the Internet. Facebook was coming along, um, mm -hmm. but there was no real technology there or nothing that was available. Um, mm -hmm. And I lived in the middle of uh, uh, nowhere. I, you know, I was the only foreign English teacher there. Uh, people all around me were Korean. Um, and so the culture was so different and so uh, unique that I, it, it was really tough the first 12 months to get into, um, uh, you know, how the society functioned. Mm. Um, and for me, those 12 months was my initiation into Korea. Um, and uh, I, I better understood after those 12 months that, well, actually, yes, it's different and every culture's unique. And um, I, I really enjoyed and found it fascinating, the Korean culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you speak Korean or did you learn the language whilst whilst you were there? <laughs> yeah, obviously being the only foreigner, um, you know, um, I think there's a sketch, isn't there? You know, I'm um, oh, what's it? Little Britain or something like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm the only gay in town or something like that. <laughs> the only gay in the village, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it, it kind of felt, you know, like I, I'm the only Englishman in the village. And I, I thought, yeah, it's kind of, um, you know, I, I felt out, out of place. Um, mm. People knew I wasn't Korean, of course. They knew I was a foreigner. Um, it, gained, you know, I gained some attention and interest and curiosity. People were curious, why, why are you here sort of thing? Yeah. Um, and, and obviously one thing to try and help me uh, get into Korean culture and feel settled within that society was to to learn um, the language. And I, I remember, um, you know, every uh, weekend or something like that would be driving, you know, my family and I would be driving somewhere and the road signs above would be in Korean and then there'd be a transliteration uh, of the English. And so um, for me, I couldn't really sit down and study Hangul, the Korean alphabet. And for me, I had to see it in front of me and yeah. um, just the way my mind works. And uh, I had to predict what the English pronunciation would be. And so after about six months, I was able to start to read the, the Korean. And then once I read it, I was able to start to study it formally, I guess. And I um, all the Korean I picked up was just self-study. Um, I never really took any um, uh, official lessons. Mm. Do you feel then that you're a better teacher because you've learned another language? Has it given you like a new, like a, a newfound appreciation of what it means to to teach and you know the long process that's required. You know, it doesn't happen overnight. Mm. Uh, I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, um, I it, it kind of gave me an insight that the first thing that it really helped me with was um, understanding why Koreans would make certain mistakes and you mm. know collocations, verb, object uh, forms. Um, mm. Uh, you know, like uh, an example for me would be, uh, you know, skiing. Um, and we, we just say uh, to go skiing or something go like that. Go skiing, yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah, uh, but for Koreans, they, you know, they say ski rul tada, which means to ride skis. And so when they're uh. speaking English, they would start to say, oh, yeah, I at the weekend I, I rode skis. And I said, OK, yeah. And... I could understand why yeah. they're making mistakes. It gave me an insight into why um, certain mm. um, things were more common um, mm. for Korean learners. And, um, mm. you know, I would be able to anticipate those issues coming up and, and start to, um, you know, 
help Koreans say, OK, you might say this, but actually in English, this is how we say it. Um, mm. Yeah, so that, that certainly helped. And the, the errors that students made, um, you know, um, I, I was told if you want to learn Korean, try to speak Korean as if they're speaking English. Uh, so, you know, they'd be saying, oh, I rode skis at the weekend and I'd go, OK, so in Korean, they'll say, say it like that, you know, um, and yeah. I thought, yeah, um, and you get to a point going, OK, this is how the Koreans would communicate. They'd be literally translating from Korean to English and, you know, you just reverse it from English to Korean and yeah. you, 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 it's kind of common sense, I guess. Yeah, kind of like th that kind of helped you then to learn Korean because the same mm. thing is with Spanish. Like I, I speak fluent Spanish and um, right. I hear the same mistakes all the time and it's because in Spanish it's said mm. in that particular way. So then it's like, oh, wow, now I can, <laughs> I can improve my Spanish because I know how to say it in, <laughs> in Spanish. The, so, yeah, yeah. the common Spanish one is uh, I have... 43 years old oh or yeah, like that. I have, yeah 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 because they yeah that's how they say it yeah like yeah. they say like tengo 40 años which is i have 40 years yeah 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 yeah, yeah. that's that's a good example <laughs> so um um why do you teach them face to face and online why why do you continue to teach um to teach online and well well i, I'm, I suppose face to face um it, it's what i'm used to it's what I've been involved with teaching predominantly face to face, apart from those two and a bit years during the pandemic. Um, and I, I find it quite fascinating. And, you know, um, you can't kind of say, well, online, te you can't replicate face to face teaching within an online environment. Mm. So um, I, I kind of try and separate it. So within a face-to-face -face, um, environment. I, I find it quite interesting to try and get the students to achieve something you can you can um, recognize by their body language or by their yeah. expressions that they've understood or they've learned something and and they they can then apply it. And um, I find that sort of immediacy and that sort of interaction that's happening within the classroom um, is quite human quite organic mm -hmm. and unpredictable at times and that that's why i continue to teach face to face um and within an online environment i suppose I, i've been teaching online for quite a while now um you you know pre-pandemic uh, by a, a number of years three years or four years um during the pandemic and then post-pandemic i'm still continuing and for me i i suppose um, well, I, I have to go back actually, and I, I went for a training session. I gave a, a training session in Germany and I was uh, meeting a variety of other teacher trainers and, uh, you know, the movers and shakers of English language teaching. And this was pre-pandemic by three years. And I said to them, well, you know, why doesn't the CELTA course or any training course offer support for those that want to teach online? And they, they kind of scoffed and said, well, online teaching that it's just uh, it won't happen. It won't it, it won't be oh, there. You know, really? it's, it's going to be. Yeah, so they yeah, they, it then basically. They they, it off. They complete, uh, yeah, they said it's not real teaching, is it? And I kind of I looked at them and I went, well, you know, if the if these uh, people that are, you know, quite prominent in Eng English language teaching dismiss it out of hand and disregard mm. it as not a real form of teaching then you know what what has to happen to make them yeah. re readjust their their yeah. opinion um because mm. you know i had quite a bit of experience teaching online and um if if these people disregard it then <laughs> the rest of the industry is going to disregard it but then i i suppose the pandemic happened and it kind of got everybody to realize well actually yeah. online teaching has its place um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um so I, I i guess for me the fact that i've been teaching online for quite a while now and then it's gained some prominence it it kind of helps keep me on top of what's expected within 
an online environment and universities nowadays they're offering face-to-face -face or online programs um, tutors need to be adaptable and they need to uh, adjust their teaching whether it's going to be in within a, a classroom environment or within an online environment and you, you'd be doing yourself a disservice if you say I'm just going to do face-to-face -face teaching and disregard online teaching and you know it, 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 it's not going to go away um, so that that's why I end up teaching both face-to-face -face and online. Mm -hmm. Do you have a preference? Um... Um, I suppose uh, the preference for me would be uh, again I, you can't you can't put those two forms of teaching together. Mm. Um, for me, if it's online teaching, my preference would be the flexibility. Um, you know, you you can connect with students around the world. Um, yeah. uh, you have that flexibility of okay, I'm going to be teaching from nine a.m. to five p.m. and you know, from nine to twelve, maybe I'll get. Uh, Southeast Asian students, um, it's their mm. evening time. And then from, yeah. um, you know, 12 to 3, maybe some Europeans, maybe a few hours later, some other Europeans. And then by the late afternoon, you'll start to get South Americans, mm. um, you know, Colombians, Brazilians I connecting that, up yeah. with you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and, and so I, for online teaching, my preference would be the flexibility and um, have, having the opportunity to connect with a wide variety of students mm. within an on uh, within a face to face environment. For me, the uh, preference would be uh, seeing them face to face, seeing them how they're reacting, their, their, their body language, their facial expressions, knowing whether they've understood something, responding to something immediately within the classroom. Um, and so that that's what I prefer about face to face teaching. But um, do I prefer one over the other? I, for me, no, I it, it, it's it's um, it's quite nice to have um, both forms of teaching available nowadays. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so do you have your own independent students or do you work for a school or some sort of academy um, or, or company? Um, well, I suppose the pandemic has kind of made everybody realize and um, understand that you've got to diversify your income and not just put all your eggs in one basket. Um, yeah. So for me, um, I'm teaching uh, or I make myself available for a, a university. Um, I also make myself available for a local language school um, and I also have my own um, online uh, profile on Preply and um, and I also get uh, a few private students um, knocking on the door, I suppose, seeing um, whether I'm able to help them. Um, so I, I, I try and div diversify as much as possible and, and see what, what kind of um, um, uh, lands. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you teach all ages, like kids, teenagers, adults? Um, well, within a face to face environment, I teach predominantly kids, but I teach adults as well. Um, so with in a local private language environment, it will be young learners, particularly this time of year. And it's nice to see so many students coming over now post pandemic. Um, it's been such a long time. It, well, it seemed like an eternity during the pandemic um, not to have any any students within our um, uh, town. Um, so, yeah, and then I can uh, jump into an adult classroom within a local language school. Within a university environment, it's undergraduate, postgraduate students, obviously adult age. Um, and within an online environment, if I'm teaching one-to-one um, -one online, um, the youngest I would say would be maybe 12 or 13, um, and the oldest would be 40 or so. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Do you have a preference? Like, do you find it easy to teach kids or is it, like for me, I find it easy to teach adults. That's like my, my preference. Yeah, just because yeah. we can talk about like um, current affairs, you know, business English. It's just, it's just more natural for me to do that. So I don't know if you have a preference. 
within an online environment or within a face to face uh, environment? face to face and on and online yeah yeah i mean i'm good okay. with kids but i can just i just feel better because i can talk about more maybe like intellectual yeah. things and you know i'm interested in like politics economy um pretty yeah. much you know like the grown up stuff then let's say you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well i i suppose um okay within a face to face environment um i suppose i've been teaching adults um for about four years now full-on um undergraduate postgraduate students um and then i was asked this year um to help out a friend uh to go in and teach young kids and i found that transition from teaching um, well-educated adult students to kids kind of difficult and i had yeah. to like try and find my place again as a young learner teacher where yeah. you know and trying to understand okay well what i had been teaching six years ago with young learners they've kind of evolved same age but they kind of evolved now um and the material that i'd been using six years ago kind of didn't work with the young learners that i now been teaching um a month or two months ago and I had to try and readjust or reevaluate, reflect, and think. Okay, um, uh, how how do I how do I be that teacher that I used to be, mm. quite comfortable within a young learner environment, um, and I, I'm getting there again in the, the, this year. I'm teaching young kids, but I prefer to teach adults. If I'm mm. totally honest, um, within a face-to-face -face environment. Um, if I'm teaching adults, whether they're elementary to upper intermediate, I like to challenge them, um, stretch them, yeah. get them to achieve some goal. Um, mm. Whereas young learners, you've got to try and keep them entertained and occupied and interested. And as soon as they lose that interest, then you've lost lost yeah. them in the lesson. Um, and it's quite intense, I guess. Um, and in an online environment as well, I've only got a few young learners that I teach. And, you know, I've been approached by the parents and spent time with the parents and, you know, the kids then join me and and we have a, a lesson together. Um, but these are well-educated Swiss teenagers as well. Um, but for me, the preference, like I said, would be adults. Like you mentioned, you can um, you can have a decent conversation with them. You you know, it's quite educational and and mm. uh, it's nice to give that sort of language that they need and, and stretch them. And um, yeah, yeah. Uh, what is it? Demand based teaching or high demand based teaching? I, I guess it's mm. uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> Yeah, 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 totally. It's like for me, um, you know, I like to smile, but sometimes, you know, it, it's okay <laughs> not to smile. But like with the kids, I, I felt that I always had to, you know, sometimes put on the front and kind of be like, yeah. I'm like, you know, always happy, which just doesn't ex doesn't exist. You know, we have our good mm -hmm. days and bad days. Sometimes I just want to be kind of serious to the point and professional. You know, mm -hmm. with adults, I find that I can just be more my myself, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense. Yeah. Um, um, I, I'm much of the same when it comes down to teaching kids. Like you said, you you put that 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 mask on, I guess, and you know you have to be um, humorous and um, yeah, uh, yeah, and, and sort well of comical and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, you know if they're they're speaking their their first language and you know you give them the look and they kind of like nudge each other and that that's okay it's good um but it's nice to give the adults some project and give them something that they'll work towards whereas kids would it, it, they need a lot of support and guidance yeah. and I, I guess i'm getting to the point now in my career where actually i prefer exam preparation classes i prefer mm teaching adults i i like that opportunity to give um you know uh, get students to achieve what they want to 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 mm. achieve yeah yeah
So talking about exams, then how do you prepare students for like IELTS? That's a, a major examination that people uh, that students take. So um, how do you yeah. go about that? Well, um, for me, um, when it comes down to IELTS preparation within an online environment, um, you know, yeah. I've been teaching uh, exam preparation online. Um, I've done a little bit face to face, but not as much as online. Um, and my first lesson would be to give the student some sort of grammatical tense review so I can see where they are and how they're they're fitting within mm. uh, their, their language ability. Um, mm. And after the initial introduction and get to know you, um, I would then assign a student some writing to do in, by themselves. And I usually say, OK, they do part one and part two within 60 minutes. Um, set a timer, finish after an hour. Um, don't worry if you can't finish everything. And I want to get some diagnostic sample of their writing ability then. Mm. Um, and then yeah. I go through it in class with them and I say, OK, and, and usually the it's the structure that kind of jumps out at me and I say, OK, when it comes down to the structure of part one and you're you're writing or you're uh, starting to report on data, this is what I would expect, um, you know, a, a sort of introduction to the topic. And, you know, some students find it difficult to say, well, actually, I just want to introduce the data first of all. And I say, no, 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 go back and you have to step back and introduce the topic to the, the examiner and yeah. and then introduce the data you're dealing with. Um, and then, OK, break it down into paragraphs, make sure there's cohesive devices and the tense is correct and, and that sort of thing. Um, and once I've gone through what's expected or you know this is a good example or a model of a, a, a piece of writing try and follow the same structure and content um, and then I give them stock phrases that it, that they could use I say well don't reuse the the language within the data or the exam question try and use synonyms um, yeah because that can knock your grade back a little bit um, and then I give them from time to time writing and then I mark it and send it back to them with my feedback um, so I spend a lesson working on the the writing and then I give them homework and then send it back to them with my feedback and uh, corrections out of the lesson then um, um, I predominantly focus on uh, conversation and vocabulary um, and base it on topics and then you know I use a variety of websites and use material from these websites that have IELTS based material there's course books available but within an online environment it's very difficult to get the student to use or to refer to a course book um, so I tend to send students some material to complete. There's vocabulary exercises, grammar exercises, some reading, uh, labeling on the reading or paragraphs and some writing. And then I say, OK, uh, send it to me before the class. We'll have a look at it together um, during the class and we'll focus on the conversation questions on that topic. And and that, that's what I tend to use. So I use topics and themes and vocabulary and develop their vocabulary awareness. Um, and, you know, I get students to, uh, you know, the predominantly most of my students have three or four months um, before they're planning to take their exam. And um, I've just had a recent student from China who I've taught for about six months or seven months now, and she's just completed her IELTS exam. And uh, she was really happy because she scored um, uh, overall, I think it was like a, a seven or something like that. And That's very high, yeah. Yeah, and her speaking, she managed to achieve the highest speaking grade that she's achieved within the IELTS exam. Um, I, I think that was a, a 6.5 or so. Um, her reading, her listening was good. Her writing was uh, quite good as well. Um, so for her to achieve a seven, she was over the moon and she was really happy and she just wants to carry on having conversation lessons with me now once. Mm. And she's uh, just entered her her pre-sessional course um, 
at at a university in the UK. So it, it's really nice to see um, that that journey with the students and um, and I wouldn't have been able to tutor that student for all that period had it not been for online teaching. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then like with the CELTA, um, talking about CELTA is like TEFL qualifications and TESOL, mm. I think there's Trinity College and all these different things. Um, do you think that it's uh, teachers should be concerned with getting these qualifications if they want to, to teach online? Um, I well, it, it's uh, it's an unregulated market, I suppose. Um, mm. Online teaching, it, it's unregulated. Uh, when I was working with um, the Chinese based organizations, um, um, these educational platforms um, that were located in either China or Taiwan or, or wherever, all they wanted was a, a TEFL um, and they weren't really aware of the, the differences between a CELTA, a Trinity CERT, TESOL or uh, um, uh, some of the unaccredited uh, uh, other courses. Um, and so um, some tutors could just do a weekend TEFL course online, uh, 25, 50 quid. It's all done. Send it to the Chinese organization. They say, yep, that's really good. OK, you're going to be earning the same money as maybe someone who's got a sell to them. Um, I, I think it kind of does a disservice to the students um, yeah. because these unaccredited courses are well they're unaccredited they're unrecognized um, if you're working for a language school in the uk that has accreditation from the british council or english uk then you need as a prerequisite uh, a trinity cert TESOL or a celta um, the other tefl courses are unaccepted um, language schools would be, uh, would have their accreditation removed if there were language, you know, teachers, language teachers um, working there without the proper um, uh, credentials. Mm, uh, but yeah. within an online environment, like I said, it's very unregulated. Um, uh, but I think if, if you're a tutor, an English tutor online, you, you know what's best. Um, and for me, you know, I take my my teaching seriously. I take this profession um, seriously. It's my passion. It's my interest. This is why I've decided, you know, early on in my career to do the CELTA course, because I knew that, OK, if I did return, uh, you know, to the UK, all that's accepted is a CELTA at that time. Um, so yeah. I need to get that CELTA. Um, if I wanted to do extra qualifications, then there was the uh, Trinity Dip TESOL um, or the Delta. Um, I decided to go straight into an MA, which had a British Council accredited uh, diploma qualification, a, a practical course, which I took. Um, so it, if online teachers are serious about their teaching, then they do what's best for the industry and this profession um, and they would invest in in their um, professional development and do the appropriate qualifications which are expected and um, you know there's tutors that do these weekend TEFL courses uh, a number of them there's quite a lot of them and yes they're teaching online they're teaching students but they they have just the practical experience of teaching online, but they don't necessarily know how language is acquired or how students yeah. learn. Um, and I, I find that, OK, for professional tutors, they can um, they can charge a rate which is commensurate to their qualifications. The, these tutors that have very limited experience, limited credentials, they'll charge a much lower rate. Um, um, and I have found some students that have moved from a tutor who was maybe 
15 dollars or or so and i'm charging double the rate and you know the student moves to me and they realize well actually yes so uh, if you if you have the qualifications and you're charging the set rate for teaching online then um you you're you're not really competing with people who have those qualifications mm. if you if you know where i'm I coming see, from i see your point there it's all that there will always be students who will pay for quality as well, you know, and, yeah. you know, you, you get what you you pay for. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, what advice then would you give to someone who is thinking about teaching online and face to face? So like you, um, you know, a blended approach, what would mm. be your advice? Well, my advice would be, OK, if you want to teach face to face, you have to have the CELTA, of course, or Trinity Cert TESOL. Get those um, and um, learn learn your craft, learn your trade, um, um, gain that experience, have someone observe your lessons, provide that feedback um, and develop the skills necessary. Learn different approaches to language teaching within a face to face environment, learn different techniques that you could incorporate um, and invest in 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 the uh, face to face class. Um, because you'll start to uh, learn some skills that could be applied within an online environment. Um, and uh, when it comes down to online teaching, um, record your lessons. Um, and then look back at how you're teaching, whether there's anything that you would like to improve upon. Um, mm. And so when I first started teaching online, um, particularly within the uh, Chinese Educational Institutes, I would record some lessons that I'd be teaching and share it on YouTube. And um, I, because I didn't know whether I was doing things right or wrong. And, you know, I, I would look back at the recording of my lesson, go, actually, OK, this was quite good. This was quite good. This needs improving. Um, and then I would share that recording on my YouTube channel um, for other teachers for the same Chinese Educational Institute as well. Um, so if you're teaching online, record your lessons, share it with other tutors, seek support because you can't necessarily have someone observing you if you're teaching privately, I guess, or teaching one to one. Um, you could do it within an institute if they have an online program. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that would be my advice and just uh, reflect uh, on your teaching, reflect on your, your practical element of teaching and, and seek advice from others and see if you could ask others to observe their lessons, whether it's face to face or online. Um, I, I, I guess that, that that would be my advice. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you think that the online teaching industry can survive? Do you think that, you know, I, cause I've spoken to various people who say artificial intelligence will take over. There, w there won't be a need for for online teachers. So, um, yeah, what's your thoughts? Um, I heard a couple of years ago that the Chinese educational institutes were recording language teachers teaching and and collecting data on online teachers wherever they're from you know you're yeah. talking 40,000 tutors online everything's being recorded and they yeah. use it to deliver online lessons automatically without the need yeah. of a tutor yeah. uh, but the Chinese um, uh, Chinese society uh, their, their policy changed and online teaching within China diminished greatly and I don't think that that is going to continue that much. Um, yes, I think the adult language learners in China will continue, um, but it'd be predominantly for passing exams or entering universities in uh, the West, UK, USA, Canada, New Zealand, Australia. Um, online teaching will never disappear. It's here to stay. Um, post-pandemic. Um, I think it will continue. Um, it, 
it's very flexible. It's quite um, comfortable um, for tutors and students alike. So I think it's going to continue. Um, yes, it's going to become a lot more saturated, which is why tutors need to stand out from the crowd, I guess. And the competition. Um, yeah. And the competition. Um, and I always say to tutors who are looking into online teaching, um, focus on a niche, niche down yeah. on, on a particular topic of, uh, you know, that others aren't necessarily doing. So for mm. me, it'd be exam preparation because some tutors don't feel comfortable, confident preparing students for exams. They don't have that experience of IELTS yeah. exams or, or um, other other. Um, international exams or Cambridge exams. So yeah, niche down and, and focus on, on what you're good at, I guess. Yeah, that's great advice. Yeah, totally agree. OK, Martin, yeah. so I think we can we can wrap it up there. So thanks a lot for the for the mm. chat. And I'm going to leave all your like your YouTube. I think you've also got a website, I believe, as well. You've got a website yeah. as well. So I'll leave yeah. all the contact details um, in the description so that anybody you know, can reach out if, if, if they wish. Sure, that's great. Yeah, thank you ever so much for the chat and I uh, hope it's useful for everyone who's uh, watched this and um, yeah, have a have a go looking at my website if you like. Um, mainly my thoughts and ramblings, I guess, of teaching either online or face to face. Um, it's uh, eltexperiences.com. So yeah, eltexperiences.com. OK, yeah, I'll leave that there and we'll um, have, have to catch up soon, Martin. So um, all the best. Yeah. And, Thank uh, you. Take care. Take care. Okay. Same to you. Bye. <laughs> Bye for now. Bye-bye.